Okay, we'll go ahead and get started now. So good afternoon and welcome to today's uh, IBM Think 2018 Comes to You webinar. We thank you very much for joining us. Uh, during this one hour session, we'll be bringing you some of the, the many highlights that we experienced during uh, IBM Think, IBM's largest conference. My name is Chris Lochelle and I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing here at PM Square. Uh, for today's webinar, I'll be serving as your MC. Uh, joining me as keynote speaker is Mike DeGoyce. Uh, he's a managing consultant here at PM Square, and he's going to be the one really diving into the meat of the content areas and then answering your questions at the end. A couple of quick housekeeping items. So we're looking to have this webinar be as interactive as possible, which can be difficult in this medium, uh, but we'll be administering a poll during the webinar, and you'll have opportunities to ask questions throughout. We're going to be answering as many questions as we can at the end of the session, and then for any questions we don't get to today, we're going to be following up with or on those. So there'll be a documented Q&A sheet that goes out to all attendees. Uh, so you can ask a question by accessing the GoToWebinar toolbar on the right side of your screen. Go ahead and log those questions at any time during the presentation, and again, they'll be aggregated and queued up at the end. So here you can see uh, an agenda for today's session. So we'll start with a, a brief introduction to PM Square, uh, and then take a high level look at the conference that was IBM Think. From there, I'm gonna turn things over to Mike and he's going to discuss the uh, latest embedding capabilities for dashboards. And then we'll take a look at the latest developments in PM Square Thrive that was shared uh, for the very first time at the conference. Then we'll get into the latest with regards to IBM's data science platform before finishing up some of the Cognos Analytics roadmap details that were shared at IBM Think. And then lastly, we'll go through our queue of questions and answer as many as we can with our remaining time. So very briefly, uh, who is PM Square? Well, we're a gold level IBM business partner that helps customers strategize, implement, and execute various analytic strategies. So, we truly try, uh, strive to be a one-stop shop for everything that you could run into and need to support your own analytics initiatives. And with that being said, our engagements take on all shapes and sizes. So we have customers currently using us and leveraging our capabilities to upgrade to Cognos Analytics. Uh, we have customers that we've helped build a training curriculum for your new users, which is very relevant right now with, with the new version and all the latest features. Uh, we have customers that leverage our capabilities and expertise with procuring IBM licensing whether that's new licensing or renewal. Um, we, we have customers that we've helped plan and execute rollouts to new groups within their organization. And then um, specifically with PM Square Thrive, our user adoption solution, we have, we have customers that we've helped plan and strategize for getting IBM Cognos Analytics to be more, uh, more adopted within their organizations. And these are just, again, just a few examples of how you could leverage PM Square. So let's talk a little about the conference that was IBM Think. So first and foremost, Think was a very, very big event. There were 40,000 estimated attendees between business partners, IBMers, and customers. Uh, there were more than 300 technical cert tests that were available to attendees to take. Uh, there were over 1,000 speakers, technical presenta presentations, and breakout sessions. And it also was a very unique event. So it was the first tech conference of its kind. IBM, which had had various technology conferences at various times in the year, merged them all together into this one mega conference covering all IBM technology. So they tried to keep it organized as best they could. It was set up into four main focus areas or quote unquote campuses to keep things somewhat organized. You had the cloud and data area, modern infrastructure, security and resiliency, and then business and AI. Uh, Think also had some extraordinary speakers as well. To name a few of them, you had Ginny Rometty, Chairman, President, CEO of IBM, uh, Dr. Michio Kaku, a renowned futurist and physicist, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, astrophysicist, and David Kenny, SVP in, of IBM Watson and Cloud Platform. So for anyone interested in attending next year, Think 2019 is going to be held in San Francisco, California in February. So if you'd rather spend your Valentine's Day with your PM Square sales rep than your significant other, start planning accordingly. So now let's go ahead and dive into the meat of the webinar and bring in Mike DeGoyes, Managing Consultant here at PM Square. So take it away, Mike. All right, thank you, Chris. All right, so let's, let's get into things here. We have quite a bit of material to cover today. And so I'm gonna try to strike the right balance of um, 
pacing the conversation here so that we get through all this material, um, but not going through it too quickly so that anything important is missed. Um, so we're going to try to strike a balance as well of giving you uh, concepts and kind of direction for things that we saw at Think as well, as well as places where you can kind of jump in and get started yourself, get your hands dirty, and start utilizing some of this technology. So to start things off, let's talk about embedding, embedding dashboards into your own environment. So IBM has introduced something um, called IBM Dynamic Dashboard Embedded. So what this is, it provides developers the ability to embed a visualization platform directly into their application. So any kind of web application, essentially, you can take dashboard functionality and you can plug it right in. So as a developer, there's the flexibility so you can define the user workflow and you can control the options available to the users. So they're not having to jump over to a separate application, interrupt their workflow in your application, but they can stay within the context of what they're already doing and can take advantage of, the cap of these dashboarding capabilities. So, and you actually have quite a bit of flexibility here. So developers, they can choose to present either something that's already been authored, um, so a, a dashboard's already been created and they can present that in an interactive manner, um, or they can actually give the kind of free form exploration interactive capabilities um, that you get if you're starting from scratch and you're creating a new dashboard in Cognos today. Or you can do kind of a, a, a mesh of functionality and provide something in between. You have a significantly granular level of control. So the idea here is that you really, you're, you're empowering users greatly, not just when they're in Cognos, but even outside of it and some other application to turn data into insights and those insights into action. So why did they go this route? Why did they introduce this? So they recognized a few client needs. Uh, clients needed the ability to visualize the growing amount of data. Obviously, this is a pretty common concern across all kinds of organizations. And they needed the ability to place, to place the visualizations where required, not necessarily requiring those users to go into some kind of separate tool. Uh, obviously, um, for any organization, for uh, every employee working there, um, allowing them to work as efficiently as possible is going to maximize uh, ROI for that business. And then this needed to be a cost-effective model. There couldn't be um, kind of massive licensing uh, concerns that would go along with uh, embedding something into a web application, which you know, obviously could become a concern pretty quickly. So what they came up with is this, this easy to use embeddable visualization capability uh, based on REST APIs um, that's gonna allow business users to very quickly create something that's compelling and interactive um, and include it in their existing web applications. So what you get with this, you get a live connection to underlying data um, and you get the smart creation of visualization. So what does that mean? So if you've used Cognos dashboarding, then this is kind of gonna make sense. Uh, if you haven't, or if you haven't used a similar type of tool, it, it might not be as obvious, but, but really what it means is that you have a field from your data and once you drag it onto your canvas uh, to start creating something, you can do just that. You could just, you could take a field called revenue and you can drag it on and the tool is going to apply some intelligence to, to go ahead and create a visual for you. It's, it's going to try to give you something that makes sense for the type of data that you, that you dragged on. So if you drag on some kind of classification, you know, like department, it might start out with just a list of, of, um, of items, of departments. Whereas if you uh, drag a number on, it would maybe summarize that number. And then if you drug the two on together, it would summarize that number by department. So you're, you're gonna get that here when you embed it. So it truly is interactive. Um, and the exploration is interactive as well. So even once you have that data on, you can filter it, uh, pretty self-explanatory, or you can use navigation paths, which are a powerful uh, component that's been introduced fairly recently uh, into the Cognos platform, which is kind of a drill up or drill down capability, although it really goes even beyond that because you don't have to just strip, stick to a strict hierarchy, but you can kind of jump around a little bit more, which is often the way it's necessary to explore data in the real world. And then you can embed these dashboards, wherever the user is, whatever application they're in without losing that interactivity. So how can you actually start getting at this stuff? Like I said, we wanna give you some places to jump in. Well, the IBM development team has been working closely with the IBM data science experience, um, which has recently uh, kind of been marketed as IBM Watson Studio. So you can actually go in there now if you already have an account or if you don't, you can create one pretty easily. 
um, and you can get started for free. And you can actually kind of see what it looks like to uh, embed the dashboard tool within that, that data science experience or the IBM Watson Studio context. Um, what they're also working on rolling out, it's in beta right now, is putting this on Bluemix, which is, which is now being called IBM Cloud. And so that's really gonna give you the full capability to embed in any type of application. So let's just look at a few screens of what this kind of actually looks like. Um, so it's not unfamiliar if you wanna go in and start doing it yourself. So this is, this is in the, the IBM uh, Cloud that I mentioned, which used to be called Bluemix. And so you have an option now in the catalog for the dynamic dashboard embedded. And again, this is in beta form, but it's already out there today. So if you choose that one, you're gonna see kind of description of what it is, and it will allow you to go ahead and get started with it. And then, so this, this gives you kind of a picture of what this could look like. Now this is in that IBM Watson Studio, um, but you, you kind of see what might be familiar to you if you've used Cognos Analytics uh, is what looks very much like dashboarding, but it's obviously embedded within a separate tool. So you have all the common elements that would be there within your IBM Watson Studio, but then you have that dashboarding functionality built in as well. And obviously from this screenshot, you can see that you, can, you could get started from scratch. It's not just the inclusion of an already created dashboard, but you could actually choose a data source and start creating your own analysis. And then here's a picture of something just a little bit more uh, completed uh, being embedded as well. This is, I think a screenshot is just a little bit older, so it still has the data science experience branding. Um, but again, you, you have a dashboard that's been created um, and then you can add to it there with your data on the left, um, or you could do the, that kind of interactive analysis that we talked about, filtering it, um, drilling into it, et cetera. So there's really four basic steps uh, to get started with this. So you first you create an IBM Cloud account and then you provision a dynamic dashboard embedded service instance. And this is all, this is done through, through a graphical interface uh, on the IBM website. This isn't, this isn't command line stuff to, to do this provisioning. So, and then you create a service credential to access that API. And then you create a dynamic dashboard session from the web service application. And then finally, you're just gonna utilize the uh, JavaScript API that's provided um, so that you can actually embed it into your web client application. And again, you can, you can actually get started with this today because it is in beta. And given that it's in beta, uh, it's actually, it's free at the moment. So it's a great time to give it a shot, get started with it. So uh, just a few specifics about what is supported and what's not supported. So from a data source perspective, uh, you can tie into to CSVs um, or DB2 in the cloud or any data sources from Cognos Analytics. And you're gonna get a live connection to the underlying data. So it's not, I'm not describing a snapshot, it's actually a live connection to, to your data source. Uh, a few things that are not supported. So you don't have the reporting and modeling capabilities from Cognos. So again, if you're familiar, reporting means kind of the full-fledged professional authoring type of capability. That's, that's not here, this is just dashboards. And you don't have the ability to create a, a data module or, or a package or anything like that um, in an embedded sense. Of course, users can go into Cognos and do that, and it can work with, with this, these embedded pieces, but the embedding is strictly the dashboarding. Um, you don't have custom widgets, so that means you can't include like an extra set of shapes, essentially, and you don't have pinned objects. So pinned objects are those that you want to re you want to reuse later or reuse elsewhere. Um, that's not included here. And then finally, intent-based authoring, that's the natural language where you can say, you know, show me revenue by department, and you can actually type that in. Um, that's not included in the, in the embedded um, dashboard functionality. But as a summary, uh, essentially everything else is there, and this gives you the capability to embed a very powerful tool directly into an application that users maybe already are using or that you're rolling out um, in your organization. Um, you have a very granular level of control over the experience, the workflow and the options that are available to users so you can tailor it uh, to their experience. And you can get started with it today. You can start test driving it for free. Um, take a look at it either in IBM Watson Studio or through IBM Cloud. All right, thanks so much, Mike. So uh, I had warned you guys at the beginning that we were gonna try to keep this session as interactive as possible, and we'll go ahead and attempt that right now. We're gonna 
take a quick poll to get some feedback from those of you who are joining us today. Uh, today's poll question is with regards to your, your CA, your Cognos Analytics upgrade. So quite simply, and let me go ahead and launch the poll now. There we go. Quite simply, uh, when are you planning to do the, your upgrade or have you already? So we have a number of our clients that are, are currently mid-upgrade with us. We have some of our clients who are just planning their upgrades now and really setting the roadmap for it. And we have some customers that are already on C11 and thriving with the new features. And we're curious, for those of you on the line, uh, what stage you're in. So we'll go ahead and let this poll run for a minute or two. And then after we compile all the answers, we're going to share the results of this poll uh, later on during the webinar. So everyone, go ahead and get your, your votes in. Then we'll go ahead and close the poll out and hand things back over to Mike. All right, great. Thanks, Chris. Okay, so now let's talk a little data science. So uh, for many of the folks on the call, uh, data science might not be directly what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, we wanted to go over a few kind of conceptual things in regards to data science, and then again, give you, give you some places where you can kind of jump in and get your hands on um, the products that IBM is offering from a data science standpoint. Um, data science obviously continues to become more and more part of the mainstream. And so we think that some of these concepts are very important for people that are in the working in the realm of analytics or uh, in, a, um, in a capacity related to analytics to be familiar with them. So let's start out just with talking about some analytics classifications. So, uh, descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. Okay, so prescriptive is essentially probably what, what many people on the call are very familiar with and, and do today. So a lot of what you do in Cognos BI or Cognos Analytics would be considered descriptive. So it's looking at information usually from the past or maybe even real time and kind of reporting on it, um, maybe summarizing it, um, giving an output of that information, um, even allowing you to slice it and dice it and such. This is essentially descriptive analytics. So predictive is, uh, as the name suggests, of course, looking into the future. So um, applying some algorithms to uh, inputs uh, from what's happened in the past or what's happening now, and then making some determinations about maybe a number or some classifications um, that are kind of looking into the future or making some determinations based on the, based on the past. And then prescriptive, is probably the one people are least familiar with, uh, but I think are going to become more familiar with um, in the very near future, um, because in some ways, it's maybe the, the ultimate expression of analytics. So it's actually saying, okay, so here's some inputs. Now, what should we be doing? Um, of course, with, with predictive analytics, you can you know, maybe get the results and you can come up with some ideas about what you should be doing, but prescriptive analytics is actually kind of giving you a plan of attack. So a, a very down-to-earth example of, of each of these buckets would be in a, an automobile uh, kind of simulated dashboard here. So the speedometer is essentially our descriptive analytics. It's just telling us how fast we're going right now. Uh, the 114 miles until empty there on the left side is a prediction. So based on our the way we've been driving, the way we're driving right now, uh, how long is it going to be until we need to uh, fill up our gas tank, get some prediction of that number. But then the prescriptive piece is our navigation there in the middle. So, um, you know, there might be a predictive element to that. Um, the system's determined that based on certain conditions or based on certain history, that some road might not be the road to be on because you might be stuck on it for a while. But based on that, it's going to give you a prescription of what route you should take. So hopefully that helps these concepts become a little more grounded for you, even though those are very simple examples. Okay, so from there, let's jump into kind of specifically data science classifications. So uh, we're gonna leave descriptive kind of for the moment and talk more about the other two. So really, first of all, just a little foundation here. Data science and machine learning and AI, these things have really been around for a while, since, since around the 1930s. Um, but there's been a number of factors recently, and it's a little outside the scope to really go into them now, but um, essentially we got, you have falling hardware prices, 
you have um, these GPUs now versus CPUs, which are able to process many more transactions simultaneously. And then you have cloud architecture, which oftentimes allows you to take advantage of unused resources and process very complex uh, calculations, kind of when those resources become available, so at a much lower price point than you could in the past. So all these things have really led to a resurgence, if you will, or a renaissance of some, some concepts that were actually thought up quite a while ago. And so um, let's talk about what some of those are. So predictive modeling, machine learning, these two things are very closely related. Um, essentially, predictive modeling usually implements some machine learning algorithms, although colloquially you might hear some people talk about machine learning in a way that's maybe um, predictive modeling, but a little more automated, like the system's kind of in an automated fashion, taking in additional data and taking the results of an additional run and then processing it back through the model. But at any rate, these two are very, very closely related. Um, machine learning can be supervised or unsupervised. We're going to see a visual in just a second, and we'll, we'll talk just a little bit more about that, although we won't go into any of this in detail here. And then deep learning. So deep learning is it's essentially synonymous with neural networks or, or artificial neural networks. These are all kind of synonyms. And, and this is really inspired by the human brain. Um, it, it essentially uses layered algorithms. So one algorithm on top of another and allows for even more complex calculations to be achieved and allows for things like finding faces of dogs that look like blueberry muffins as you see there in the bottom right hand corner. Um, but in all seriousness, uh, the, the primary use case right now for deep learning is actually an image recognition. Obviously, there's, there's many legitimate business cases in addition to the ones that you might be able to kill time with on the internet. Um, but that is the primary current application for deep learning. And then finally, there's decision optimization. So decision optimization, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about here in a second, but this is that prescriptive piece. So the first few there, those are all considered predictive analytics, and then decision optimization is prescriptive. Okay, so, so here's a visual that kind of gets at um, machine learning concepts. So essentially, you give some input. Um, the input here is a picture of a cat, which is kind of a classical example, but this could be this could be structured data as well. It could be something from a database table or some other unstructured text or audio. And then you do either supervised learning or unsupervised. So if it's supervised, um, a person is essentially providing some labels. So it's saying like, I want to recognize cats. Um, so teaching the machine to actually classify things as such. Unsupervised is not providing the labels. So it's allowing the system to find commonalities and then come up with labels essentially, or come up with groupings. And then the output there on the right, we're not gonna go into this in detail, but essentially, you know, you're know, you coming up with there's some way to classify, um, which is saying what something is. Regression is essentially coming up with a number or a value, or then clustering is saying, okay, this thing belongs with some other things. So these are essentially at a very, in a very basic level, the inputs and outputs for machine learning and for really predictive analytics in general. So let's try to relate predictive to prescriptive. Okay, so here's some examples from, from a business context. So in marketing, you might predict a camp campaign's return on investment, but based on that, you then can prescribe a plan or a marketing campaign. And I'm not gonna talk through each one of these individually, but you can just kind of look through them and you can see essentially at the prediction level, each one of those provides some type of a number which is something that someone could, could use to then do something, a business value, but it's not, it's not a direct plan in itself or at the prescribed level, there's some optimization that's being taken place. It's, it's optimizing maybe what you're doing with that information from the prediction and then helping you figure out what action to take. So let's kind of look at a very briefly one specific use case. So this is kind of a, a marketing uh, type of example. So the input that you would have to your predictive model would be information about a, a customer, a potential customer. Okay, so James X here, we're gonna feed in a gender, age, 
income, essentially demographic information. And we're going to feed that into a revenue scoring model, and it's then going to predict, okay, so what kind of revenue could we expect? And this looks like kind of a banking example. In terms of mortgage, savings, pension, what, what values are to be expected here? So based on this, we can come up with this table and we can say for each client, here's what we would expect. But still, what, what do we do with that? Or, you know, probably any person working in this business would have some idea of what to do. But how do we act most efficiently and effectively? So that's what the prescriptive or the, the decision optimization helps us do. So the inputs of this would be things like list of clients, list of offers. Then maybe we feed in that predicted revenue per client. But there's some business rules that are applied as well. So each client can only get one offer. And then for the simple example, each offer can only be used at most three times. Obviously, in a, in a real world scenario, these numbers would be much larger. They're probably more complex business rules. Um, but we feed this then into our optimization model. And it then helps us come up with a plan as far as which particular offers each should be made to each client in order to maximize our return. Okay, so hopefully that helped at a conceptual level to make a bit of a distinction between these different types of analytics and particularly to kind of introduce more or prompt some more thought in terms of uh, prescriptive analytics in particular. So uh, these are some ideas about how you can actually get a jump start, get started with some of these things. Um, so these are all tools that you can uh, go to these web addresses that are listed and you can very quickly jump in and get started with them. Um, the SPSS one is the only one that actually requires a download. Um, but this is that's actually a good one to get started with. SPSS has been around for a long time. It's renowned, it's proven, it's, it's used many, many places. So if you haven't done anything predictive to this point, um, that's not a bad thing to do is you can go out and you can get a free trial of SPSS and you can kind of get started with some of these concepts. Um, it will cause you to brush up on your statistics a little bit, but you don't have to be a data scientist or a statistician to utilize SPSS Modeler. Um, furthermore, more and more of this is being pushed to the cloud. So you now have within the data science experience or Watson Studio, you have kind of predictive modeling functionality, machine learning functionality that's being included there as well. So you can go sign up for that and without even having to download anything to your desktop, you can get going and start experimenting with some of these things. And then finally, decision optimization. Same thing, there's a cloud offering that IBM has available and you can sign up for free and give it a shot. Now, this can get very complex very quickly. Um, you, with the decision optimization, there's complex mathematical um, formulas or algorithms that are fed in generally to decision optimization um, applications. But the good thing is there's actually a bunch of examples uh, there. So if you go and sign up, there's a list of, I don't know, a, a dozen or maybe a couple dozen different examples where there'll actually be kind of a description of a use case. There'll be an example of the logic that's being used. So it's a great way to get plugged in and get started and gain a deeper understanding of some of these concepts. All right, so before we jump into PM Square Thrive, I think Chris is maybe gonna share some poll results with us. Yeah, thanks so much, Mike. So let's go ahead and pop those up. So as you can see from the poll on your screen, we've got uh, half of the people attending the webinar today are already on Analytics V11, Cognos Analytics, and, um, and the vast majority of the others are looking at doing so in the next 12 months with the majority of those folks looking to do it within the next six months. So you can definitely see that the, the tide is shifting here and um, this time next year, we're expecting the vast majority of everyone to be on, on C11. Great. Okay, that's, and that's really helpful here as we go through the rest of, of the webinar, uh, just for a little context. So I know where our audience currently stands. So about half of you are already on Cognitive Analytics, so you're probably pretty familiar with the, uh, the dashboarding element that we looked at how to embed. I'm sure a large amount of the rest of you have at least seen it at this point. But as we go in and start talking about Thrive here, um, this is kind of relevant to where you are as well. And so I, I wanna tie that in a little bit to what we've heard uh, from, from the audience, both in terms of Thrive as well as the roadmap we're gonna talk about here in a minute. 
Okay, so what is Thrive? Thrive really is, it's analytics for your analytics is what we like to call it. So it's, it's looking at what you are doing in your analytics environment and then providing you information about that um, so that you can be more effective in user adoption and in taking advantage of the investment that you've made, uh, whether it be an IBM Cognos or even if we go kind of um, back downstream in the analytics lifestyle, a life cycle, and look at how you're prepping your data and such. That all kind of feeds in or culminates into Cognos quite frequently. So we think that there's a lot of value for businesses in taking a look at this. So here are some questions that we were getting from a lot of a lot of our clients, um, or that we were asking our clients. I'm sorry, and they were having a hard time answering quite frequently. So what's your current version of Cognos? Okay, well you can find an answer to that pretty pretty quickly. Um, but some of these items in here are not so easy to answer. So how many reports do you have that would need to be moved to Cognos 11 if you're doing a migration? Um, how many framework models do you have? Um, how many dynamic cubes do you have? Do you use some of these other studios that aren't really part of the, the core of Cognos 11? Um, how, many, how many users do you have? I mean, how do you even answer that question? And in, in one sense, you could say, well, like we have this many, but how many of those haven't really logged in in the last year? Or how many versus how many of those are in the application every single day? How do you quantify who's an active user? And what are those people, what are they actually doing? Are they just, are they running reports? Are they building reports on their own? Are they modeling? So these kind of questions are important both when migrating, uh, from Cognos 10 to Cognos 11 or doing any kind of migration between Cognos versions, but they also can be very helpful in just knowing the health of your current environment, knowing how it's being used, whether people are taking advantage of the resources that um, your developers are working hard to create. So of course, we have the Cognos audit reports. Th those have been there for a long time. Um, and they answer some, do a good job of answering some pretty basic questions like, um, you know, like which report's been run uh, during some time frame? <laughs> How many times has it been run? You might be able to get that from an audit report. But we found that there's a, a number of problems or, or limitations, if you will. So it's very narrow slices of usage. They're definitely not comprehensive. If you want to customize them, it's time consuming. Um, the, the package that it's based on isn't even inclusive of everything that's available in the underlying audit database. You, you definitely aren't getting any higher level statistics like like trending over time or kind of comparing different periods of usage. So, I mean, they're good for if you just need a point in time to figure out kind of like what happened in regards to something fairly specific. But if you really want to use them for kind of usage and adoption monitoring or to see how your system is behaving, you're probably going to run into some limitations. And there's, there's even inaccuracies in them. They're not always up to date. So there's just a lot of limitations with the basic audit reports. So we created something called Thrive. So this is really an application designed for user adoption and monitoring. PM Square, an important value for us when we work with our clients has always been and will continue to be user adoption because we feel very strongly that you can create the most beautiful looking dashboards. Um, you can um, create the reports that show up in people's inboxes every day on schedule. You can give them all kinds of opportunities to explore data, but if no one's actually using it, then you haven't created something of value to the business. And so that's really what prompted us creating this application. And so this gives you things like top reports, packages and users for your environment, uh, metrics about those users, how their usage patterns are changing, uh, trends over time, more advanced visualizations, uh, which reports or packages are maybe underutilized, um, and then allows you to all, even monitor which features are being utilized uh, within your environment. And this is, this is a modern software as a service application that's really intended to give you insights into what's going on in your environment. So here's a little bit just about the foundation of it. Um, uh, it's a custom developed application on the mean stack um, utilizing D3.js and tabulator. Um, it's, it's very interactive, filterable, it presents you a lot of data, but in a very intuitive uh, manner. It allows you to define custom groups. So you're not, you're not, you don't just have to utilize, 
you know, kind of like broad set. So let's say of users, you could actually group a set of users together and say, hey, this is our marketing department. I want to see kind of what their usage patterns look like. You can do that in the application. And then you can search for objects um, in Cognos, like a user or a port or a package, find what you're looking for easily. And here's a, just a, a brief look at kind of what's going on in the back end, how this all is happening. So you have this Cognos audit database, and then there's a little piece called the Thrive Data Uploader that essentially extracts the data from the audit database, puts it into the Thrive Cloud, where that data is stored and analyzed. And then the user can just go in through an interactive web portal, and they can explore that information to derive those insights. So here's a picture of what that looks like. Um, th this was actually something that we showed off, um, actually did interactive demonstrations uh, at the conference. Um, and we, you'll hear more in a minute about how you can see an interactive demonstration of that here in the near future. We're not gonna do that today, but this gives you at least a visual in your head as we're talking about these concepts of what this actually looks like, what kinds of information is being communicated, kind of how, how intuitive it is and how you can see quick trends and summaries at a glance. So part of, part of that, um, part of those insights uh, into, your, into your environment is going to allow you to kind of clean up your environment. So you'll be able to clear up cobwebs, so objects that have little or no usage, easily identify object owners, and identify orphans as well. So objects you don't have any owners at all, or, and maybe suggest potential new owners for those objects. This kind of thing is all really important. Um, it can be important in general in keeping your environment clean, but when you talk about doing a migration, which it sounds like about half the audience here is thinking about doing in the upcoming year, these are important questions to be able to answer. Um, you can spend a whole lot of time, um, not just on a Cognos 10 to Cognos 11 migration, but also uh, migrating from compatible query mode to dynamic query mode. Um, probably a number of you are kind of familiar with, with that concept. And the whole Cognos modern architecture is based on dynamic query mode, but there's can be significant changes that are needed to models and reports in order to be compatible. So if you can identify easily which objects are actually high use, you can maybe cut out a swath that you don't need to spend valuable development time on updating them. And for the ones that you are going to update, maybe you can prioritize those. So you can do, you know, at the top 200 first, focus your time there. And then as time allows, you can tackle those that are only run, you know, once a year or once every few months. So this just provides a little bit of additional information about as you roll out Cognos Analytics, kind of how you can utilize um, the features of Thrive to make that a smoother process. And um, kind of as you do it, you can actually assign those users to a group and then you can track and see how their usage patterns maybe change as you roll out these new features. Because obviously Cognos Analytics is not just kind of a, a point release with the same functions. It was, it's kind of a paradigm shift in offering all this new interactive exploration capabilities. And so uh, we think it's very wise for uh, companies that are migrating to understand uh, how their users are utilizing the new features. And so seeing usage patterns and then which features they're actually using once they migrate, this can be super valuable information to making sure that you're getting value uh, out of your investment. So here's just some things that are that are upcoming um, that we plan on adding into this. And uh, I'll just touch on these briefly. So uh, we wanna add in additional Cognos data. So it won't just be things from the audit database, um, but additional information that might come from the content store, um, et cetera. Um, we're looking at adding other sources of data in. So obviously this, this is, would be kind of a paradigm shift in itself, but really allowing you to see broadly your organ, in your organization, if you have any other, other analytics tools, um, how those are being used as well. So you can get a more complete picture of uh, how data is being used in your organization. And then also we're going to be adding in uh, AI to the system so that it can do some classification. Um, maybe it can determine who's a power user, who's just kind of a casual or user or a consumer and classify them accordingly. 
um, identify leading indicators of change based on patterns from the past and provide notifications so that you can kind of check in with users or even prompt them um, to go back and uh, maybe revisit something they haven't looked at in a while. Okay, so if, if all of this is interesting to you, um, there's two things you can do. One, you can go to the URL that's on the screen there and you can uh, sign up for, for updates uh, or sign up for beta testing. There's a form that will allow you to just get updates if you want in your email inbox or to ask to be a beta tester. And then secondly, there's going to be a webinar that's gonna be held in June. Um, so uh, it's a little bit out in the future, but go ahead and uh, just drop a um, placeholder on your calendar and tune in on June 7th. Okay, so we are now to the Cognos Analytics Roadmap. So here we wanna look at uh, what we're gonna call rumors and ruminations. So what may be upcoming uh, in the product in the near future? So I'm not going to read you the entire IBM disclaimer statement, um, but I'm gonna leave it up here for a second. <laughs> Essentially what this says is that IBM has shared their plans for what they're going to develop, but this stuff is all still under development. So just because something's shown here or they showed it at the conference doesn't mean that it's going to materialize in that exact form um, or that we're even gonna see the feature at all. Um, generally from what we've seen in the past, many of the things that they show in these types of roadmap sessions, it does show up, but a few things maybe don't or they look a little different. So that's the gist of it. And again, our disclaimer is essentially just the same uh, as what IBM said there, just in a few less words. Okay, so let's look at um, some of the things that are being introduced. Uh, so first of all, uh, this concept of the image gallery. So um, if you've used a report authoring today, um, you know that in order to get an image in, it's not the most intuitive thing. Um, so they're gonna make that a lot easier. So you're gonna get multiple folders for organization, and then when you drop an image in, rather than going and having to open up a property and specify the number of pixels for width and height, you're actually going to be able to just click handles and drag it to size it to your environment. Um, we have throughout some of these features, some unanswered questions that are just things that we've kind of been pondering based on what we've seen. And IBM might even still be figuring out how some of these things are going to work. So we don't have answers for these things today, but um, we don't know exactly how these images are gonna be governed. Um, we understand that you're not gonna to have to go and upload them to the server ahead of time. You're gonna be able to add them um, interactively uh, through the user interface, but we don't know exactly how, the, how governing those will work. And we don't know how this works with dynamic images from URLs or, or from your data. So there's still some things to be seen, but this should definitely uh, make it easier to work with images. And kind of on a similar note, this drag and drop placement. So uh, if you work with dashboards, like in dashboards, you can drag uh, something directly onto the report exactly where you want it to be, and that's where it will show up. Well, you're gonna be getting a similar concept uh, in authoring, uh, at least that's the plan. So you can drag something directly onto the canvas, and it's gonna show up right there where you dragged it. You don't have to put in a table first, um, Today, if you want to put something on a page, you gotta set up a table, kind of set up the appropriate rows and columns so that you can position something as you like it. Um, not the case with what IBM is looking at introducing here. So we don't know how this works exactly in the background at this point, that might still be getting ironed out. We don't know if it's making tables and you're just not having to specify them yourselves or if things are being coded differently. We don't know exactly how existing pixel perfect reports will be impacted, but, um, this should make it, should definitely shorten the runway uh, to creating reports, especially when combined with a few of these other things we're gonna see, like the format painter. So you'll be able to select multiple elements on the page and you'll be able to paste existing or new styles. So um, if anyone has experienced any frustration in Cognos 11 with not being able to select multiple objects and do a format paste onto them, that could be alleviated here. We don't know for sure if it's gonna work with copied styles yet, but we have encouraged our customers and, and we as a best practice try to implement styles and classes frequently when we're doing development because it really aids in um, 
uh, consistency across environments and it can really help reports be created more quickly. And so this is surfacing some of those things, making them more uh, easily available. I'm very excited about this, the ability to copy and paste objects. So that doesn't mean copy and paste objects within uh, a dashboard or report, obviously you can already do that. This means taking something uh, from one dashboard and then you can put it um, in a report. So you're actually getting some, um, some interchange between two separate, app what have been completely separate applications really, other than they utilize the same um, data sources. You'll be able to take an object from a dashboard, put it into a report. So lots of questions with this. Um, how are the prompts handled? Uh, how are master detail relationships handled? We don't know all the details of those things now, but this conceptually is going to be very powerful. Uh, so similarly, you'll be able to take something from a report, and this doesn't just mean if you're in a if you're in authoring and you're designing a report, but even if you ran a report and you like a visualization that's in it, you are you'll be able to copy it and then paste it into dashboards. And furthermore, you'll be able to more precisely place it where it should be because of the much demanded feature of grid lines. So this is very emphasized here because a lot of people were asking for this. So you get, you get grid lines, you get the ability to snap to grid. So you can position things precisely, make sure they line up and are professional and then snap to object as well. So when you drag something else onto the page, you can make sure it is aligned. So you'll be able to edit visuals in place and do so more precisely. So adding titles, of course, but also being able to modify the colors of those titles, the font, et cetera. Uh, that will be just provide a more granular level of control within dashboarding. Again, we're talking about dashboarding here. Obviously, you could do those kinds of things in authoring for a long time. Being able to choose a very specific color from a palette rather than being constrained to some predefined color palette. Uh, when you suggest one, Cognos will suggest some complementary colors, which should lead to uh, more visually appealing uh, dashboard designs while still giving you control. You can change those if you don't want to utilize the complementary colors that are suggested. Um, there's an expansion of uh, mapping that continues to be, uh, to be added onto, and so specifically introducing this lasso tool. So um, if there's points on a map, you don't have to control click to select them, but you could actually lasso the ones that you want. And this will be implemented elsewhere as well, such as in a scatter plot. Um, there's some new visuals that are being introduced, specifically this driver spiral from Watson. So the, the spiral visualization essentially shows you the predictive strength of a particular field or a combination of fields. Um, and so that's, this was in Watson Analytics, it's being brought now into Cognos Analytics. Now, this is perhaps the most exciting of all. It's this completely new studio uh, that's kind of based on Watson Analytics. Um, it's called Exploration. Okay, so here's kind of a close up of what it looks like. So we're gonna dive into some different elements here uh, that make up an exploration. So you get to this through any existing visualization. So you could add, have a visual in, in a dashboard and then there's gonna be a button called Explore, and this takes you to this exploration module. So exploring a visualization, it's gonna show you details, but in a natural language, and it's gonna to try to point out things that maybe would necessarily be immediately obvious. So you see some examples there. Um, values range between a minimum of four, a maximum of 97, just some things that you would otherwise have to deduce by trying to look at that visual and pull them out. In a natural language, they're gonna be communicated to you from Cognos using some intelligence. Um, when you're in this exploration module and you're looking at a visualization, uh, there's going to be related visualizations that are going to show up at the top of the screen and that will be suggestions that maybe you would have additional insights embedded in them. And those related visualizations are actually going to be learned. So what other people in your environment liked, what they found useful, you'll see there's kind of a thumbs up, thumbs down button there. So if another user found something useful, or if you have found a particular type of visualization to be useful, that's going to be recorded and it's going to be used to come up with smarter recommendations.
And as you explore these uh, visualizations, there's gonna be this bar on the left that is going to show you a, a history of the visualizations that you have gone through. And I think this is a really smart idea because the whole idea is being able to explore. And if you're worried about not being able to get back to some visual you were looking at because it had something interesting in it, so you're hesitant to click on another thing or kind of drill in to find more information, then it would potentially impede your exploration. But by having this, you can always get back to something that you were looking at a minute ago. And then at the bottom of that, there'll be a button so that you can actually create a, a new exploration. And any of these natural language uh, insights that are provided, you'll be able to click on those and it's going to then put a visual element um, onto your existing visual that will illustrate uh, that insight. So for instance, this average here, you see it, it threw a bar on to show you where that average actually sits. Or likewise, uh, if you click on the, in this example, the near north side loop, you see it, it, uh, uh, there's a few items here that are highlighted based on the uh, natural language insight that was provided. And then there's these numbers on um, the axis titles that, um, they have predictive insights basically embedded in them. So if you click on them, you're gonna see the predictive insights that are there, and then it's gonna show you the strength of those uh, predictive insights. And if you click on those, then you can get um, to this sunburst decision tree, which is essentially gonna give you kind of a visual of how that predictive strength was actually reached. And, and this as well, this visualization is also totally interactive and you'll find more details about it in natural language. So it's, as you can tell, this is kind of part of the whole exploration model. As you dive into something and get another visual, it retains those same elements. And so you can ask Cognos questions as well in natural language, just like it provides you information in natural language. You can also feed natural language in. You could ask what a data source is. You can ask for clarification. If you might give you multiple answers, multiple possibilities you can cycle through. Um, often the answers will be a visualization. And they're even looking at on Cognos Mobile, uh, being able to utilize your voice. So to actually ask, hey, can I see um, you know, revenue broken out by business unit and have a visual created based on that voice input. Potentially very powerful stuff. So we're really excited about some of the things that are coming down the pipe here that are on the roadmap. Again, we don't know if everything will show up exactly as it was illustrated at the Think Conference, but these are definitely the areas that are being focused on, and we're looking forward to seeing a lot of these things show up in the product in the near future. Okay, great, thanks, Mike. So before we jump into Q&A, and again, another reminder that you can uh, you can post a question in the uh, GoToMeeting, GoToWebinar interface on the right side of your screen. But before we get into that, I wanted to invite everyone to stay connected to us in a couple different ways. Uh, one, you can check out our newsletter, the PM Square Journal, uh, which we try to jam pack with the most relevant updates in the industry, as well as articles addressing both uh, technical and business topics. So make sure you're on that newsletter list. Uh, additionally, visit the PM Square website blog, which houses a lot of the, the technical articles as well as additional uh, items for you to consume there as well. One other thing, we, we uh, Mike mentioned this earlier on the uh, pr presentation here, but we do have a couple upcoming webinars. Uh, on May 10th, we're going to be diving into IBM's new FlexPoints program for IBM licensing and sharing with you everything you need to know and how you can take advantage of that. And then on June 7th, we'll be showing you how you can proactively monitor, quantify, and promote user adoption uh, within your company with PM Square Thrive. And, and by then, some of those uh, roadmap features that Mike talked about earlier today will, uh, will be in the product to, uh, to be able to show off at that point. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into Q&A. Uh, due to co time constraints, we're not going to be able to answer all these questions, but again, we'll be sending both the slides from today's presentation, as well as a consolidated Q&A document to all attendees after the, uh, after the webinar. So please do input as many questions as you'd like in the question pane. If we don't get to it on this session, we'll make sure that all questions do eventually get answered and sent out as part of that Q&A doc. So Mike, for you, uh, first question, are embeddable dashboards available today? 
They are, yes. So the, at least in uh, beta form. They're in uh, fully baked form if you're going to IBM Watson Studio. If you want to embed them in your own application uh, by utilizing the IBM Cloud, uh, that's in, in beta form. So absolutely go out and start figuring out if it works for the use case that you have in mind. And um, I don't have a specific date for when it'll be out of beta, but I expect that in the near future. So I would, I would say now's the time to jump in and give it a try. Excellent. Uh, next question is, uh, we don't currently do any predictive or prescriptive analytics at my organization. How do you recommend going about getting started? That's a great question. So uh, one, of the, one of the key things that I think often gets kind of left behind or missed when this kind of thing is discussed is making sure that you're at a place from a kind of data maturity or analytics maturity standpoint to be able to get in to predictive. So uh, what that really means is you just need to have a good handle on the data in your organization. So looking at things like um, data governance and data integration, making sure you have the elements available that will provide you um, results that will be meaningful um, is a huge part of, of getting started. So if you feel confident that you're there, then you're, you're really at a place where you can start to introduce some of those tools. So, um, you know, there were some links that, that were provided earlier, um, and you can also just kind of Google um, those concepts and you'll easily find the, the IBM pages. But if you want to start get test driving those tools, that's a great place to start. But also try to look a little more holistically and make sure that in your organization, you're at a place where you can, you'll be able to feed you know, relevant factors in, relevant data into those predictive or prescriptive models to get answers that will provide you uh, relevant and valuable results. Excellent. Uh, next question is with regards to PM Square Thrive. Uh, does it work on Cognos 10 or Cognos 11 right now? So it'll it'll work on on either one. And um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it can it can really be helpful as you transition from one to the other. So if you're on Cognos 10 right now and you're thinking about migrating to Cognos 11, which is obviously something that based on the poll results about half of you are thinking about um, there you might be have a tendency to think like well I'll wait I'll roll that out as part of Cognos 11 um, we would encourage you to to not wait on it because we do think that there is a lot of insight to be gained in seeing your current usage patterns in Cognos 10 and then comparing them to usage patterns once you go to Cognos 11 so um, we think there's value in jumping on that as soon as possible Okay, great, and that's all the time that we have today for, for Q&A. Again, we thank everyone for joining and hope to see you on future PM Square webinars. And as a reminder, we'll be sending the slides in the consolidated Q&A document as a follow-up, so keep an eye out for that. But thanks again, and this is the end of the webinar.